let's turn to number 493, Fill My Cup, Lord, 493. Like the maid at the could not satisfy and then I heard my Savior speaking draw from my well that never shall run dry fill my cup Lord I lift it up more come and quench this thirsty love my soul But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, and quench this thirsty love, my soul. stand for our theme song lead them my god to thee number 653 and let's um do number three and four so verse three and four of number 653 Such little ones, Christ came a child, and in this world of pain lived undefiled. Oh, for his sake, I pray, lead them, my God, to thee, lead them, my God. Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School. Shall we open with prayer? Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we thank you for a beautiful Sabbath day. 
and we expect many blessings that's why we're here and we know others are coming and you will bring them please guide us with your spirit and help us to learn something that will help us during the week to walk more with Jesus and we pray in his name amen please be seated this weekend, uh, some of you were here last night, but all through this, uh, later on the morning and the afternoon, we'll be studying a lot of things from the book of Revelation. We have Pastor Scott Burgess and his family here, and I don't know if it's coincidence or you know how God works through providence, so I was supposed to be superintendent last weekend, and that got swapped to push back to this weekend, and I'm also going to look at some things in Revelation, a few details about pearls, gates of pearl. Have you ever heard of those? So if you want to flip in your Bible to Revelation 21 or so, then we'll watch our mission video and then we'll be talking about what does the Bible teach about pearls from earth to the gates of heaven. But first we want to see what God is doing around the world through his faithful missionaries aided by our prayers and our faithful giving. Thirty years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist Church embarked on a bold new mission focus that would totally change the face of the church. Church leaders identified key areas where the mission was struggling. Although the church was growing rapidly in certain parts of the world, many areas and people groups remained totally unreached. The church would continue working in areas where it was doing well. But something needed to change if we were to be faithful to the Great Commission to go to all peoples. At the General Conference session in 1990, delegates voted the Global Strategy document and Global Mission became an urgent new mission focus. There were two key objectives. One, to alert church members to the large number of unreached people groups and two, to plant new groups of believers among those groups. Since 1990, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has nearly quadrupled in size. Millions of new believers have found life in Jesus and have joined the Adventist family. They've come from new territories, new people groups, different cultures. They've brought joy to heaven and strength to God's church. We praise God for the thousands of new groups of believers that have been planted. And yet, we're still here. Mothers still sit and beg beside busy city streets. Many still wake each morning in fear of the spirit world. Millions in the 1040 window have never even heard of the name Jesus. Only one third of the people on earth are Christian. Two thirds follow other world religions. And a growing number claim no religion at all. And still there are cities of more than one million people with no recorded visit by even one Seventh-day Adventist. We so long for Jesus to come. That's why Global Mission continues to focus on unreached people in the 1040 window, the cities, in the secular postmodern West. Global Mission sends out thousands of Global Mission pioneers to start new groups of believers among the unreached. That's why it supports tent makers in the world's most challenging regions. And that's why Global Mission is helping to start hundreds of urban centers of influence in cities across the globe. Today, six Global Mission Centers focus on the most effective ways to share the good news with people from non-Christian backgrounds. These centers find the best ways to build bridges of understanding and help field test resource materials, methods and models. Their goal is to remove barriers that make it difficult for people to understand and accept the gospel. We praise God for the millions who have found hope and peace in Jesus since Global Mission began. But we need more Global Mission pioneers. We need more urban centers of influence. And we need more prayer. Thirty years ago, Adventist church leaders cast a bold vision for mission. That vision still burns strong. To reach unreached people. To reach teeming cities to reach those who feel no need of religion. Today, we still need people to answer the call to mission, to reach the unreached with hope, 
to share the good news about Jesus. We need people who will answer the call that still echoes after 30 years. We need people who will say, I will go. I guess we can't be too confident, can we? No matter how many people learn about Jesus, there are many, many more. And that I will go phrase is the new theme for uh, the strategy for evangelism that was supposed to be unveiled at General Conference last summer, which we all missed because <laughs> it was online. No, no such animal meetings were online. So we want to talk about gates of pearl and consider pearls from earth to heaven. There's only a few texts in the Bible, but what do we know? Where do pearls come from? Okay, they come from oysters, mussels, or clams, and you think of that little irritating grain of sand. Uh, Pearls.com says actually the irritant is usually a parasite. Something works its way into this oyster, mussel, or clam, and the defense mechanism is to put this fluid out which coats it, and it hardens in layer after layer after layer till you get this beautiful, valuable object. The process takes years. And really a small percentage, maybe 5%, are ever gem quality pearls. Pearls are properly used how? As jewelry. Is that, is that what God's people want to do? These are great pearls. Let's just put them all over. Well, the Bible says God's people don't use pearls for personal adornment. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. You might want to write that down or look it up quickly. Paul says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And later on it says, uh, not with gold or pearls or costly array, but with what? Good works, our character. Our pearls to be seen externally should be our character. How we respond, how God has worked in us through irritations of life. But who does wear? Well... Who does wear the pearls? The Bible tells us who, who is decked with pearls, and that's in Revelation. Do you know? Revelation 17, there's an impure woman that symbolizes false religion, and we know her as? Babylon, and she's decked with pearls. Revelation 17, 4 says, And the woman was arrayed, in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And had the golden cup, all the abominations. She buys and sells pearls and she wears pearls, but not for much longer. Revelation chapter 18 tells about these pearl merchants. They're bewailing Babylon because now we see a scene of Babylon going up in smoke. And verse 10 of chapter 18 says, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And verse 11, The merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And what is Babylon selling? The list is long. It's all the things people buy and sell around the world, basically. But verse 16, they're saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple, scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Again, Babylon was decked, outwardly adorned. But verse 17, for in one hour so great riches is come to nothing, come to naught. And every shipmaster, everyone watched and said, oh no, there she goes. We lost everything. Well, we have more about pearls in the Bible. Pearls symbolize spiritual treasures, often unappreciated spiritual treasures. Matthew 7, if you want to look there, Jesus talked about pearls in a sense. In Matthew 7, verse 6, he said, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, 
lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So we can see the substitution of that which is holy in the first phrase and the next phrase, pearls. Do pearls represent something holy, holy truth, spiritual treasure? Jesus seemed to think so. Just a few chapters later, Matthew 13, we can flip forward. He told some parables about the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 13, verse 44 to 46, he's describing those who appreciate spiritual treasure. In verse 44, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth how much? Everything he has to buy that field so he can get the treasure. And more specifically, verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like who? A merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had again and bought it. Is there a spiritual lesson in that short little parable? I think so. In the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 252, Ellen White writes about this verse, these verses. In order to obtain a vast treasure that is supposed to be hidden in a field or a gem that is of great and unknown value, the man who is seeking for riches, these, these merchants, he will invest all his substance in the field, or he uses it to purchase the jewel, the precious jewel, and he calculates that it will, what, decrease in value? Increase in value, right, in his hands. And it will bring him a fortune. And so should the Christian who desires the riches of heaven set aside all considerations that interfere with his eternal welfare and put his soul into the work of securing the riches of Christ's love. Do we have things that interfere with our interest in heaven? COVID-19, to be one, huge distraction, right? The things that the world is focusing on can sidetrack us from focusing on the pearl that we are meant to get, the riches of heaven. And so talent, means, energies, all should be applied so we would win God's approval. Jesus directs us to infinite riches, hidden where all may engage in searching for them, sure of being successful, and it says, Jesus came from heaven to direct our search. So does he want us to find the pearl of great price? High and low, rich and poor, stand on an equal footing, and none need seek in vain. Obedience to his will is the one condition of success. And well may the earnest seeker afford to sell all that he has to possess this blessing of divine love, the pearl of great price. So is it a fair trade if we would give everything and make Jesus our highest consideration? Is it a fair trade? I believe so. Now is the time to acquire this pearl, and this is why we study scripture more and more earnestly. Now let's try something. Turn in your hymnal to 421. We're going to sing verse 5, a cappella. And 21, there's one verse about these pearls and the gates of pearls specifically. For all the saints. And that's verse 5. Sing with me. From earth's wide bounds, from ocean's farthest coast, through gates of pearl, streams in the countless host. Singing to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Alleluia, Alleluia. Isn't that beautiful? We are singing about exactly what the Bible says, gates of pearl. Are there any gate-sized pearls on earth just now? 
No, I looked this up. I think the current largest is the Puerto Princesa Pearl, uh, reported in 2016 by CNN as a whopping 67 centimeters long, about 2.2 feet, and 30 centimeters, or about a foot wide. So something like this. That's not a gate, is it? No, but that's huge in our, in our day. So we sang about this countless host of saints enters the New Jerusalem, kind of like our mission report. The gospel goes to every nation, kindred, tongue, people, tribe. And back in Revelation 21, we are told in verse 12 who goes through those gates. And we had a sermon recently. Do you remember who goes through those 12 gates of pearl in Revelation 21? Hmm. Let's read verse 21 because that's, this is what the hymn is pointing to. Revelation 21, 21 says, And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And verse 12 tells us who the gates are for. Who goes through them? The 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. And there's more detail given in Ezekiel 48, 22 and 23. We don't need to turn there now, but it explains that strangers who sojourn among the different tribes, they also inherit with them. Just like now, Paul teaches us in Galatians 3.29, if we belong to Christ, then we are the seed of Abraham. We're part of those 12 tribes, and God will tell us, I guess, which gate uh, we enter in. There's a lot of beautiful symbolism in these heavenly gates of pearl, and we're going to enter a most valuable kingdom. Isn't that what heaven is? It costs everything we have to enter. But do we purchase and enter heaven by our own efforts then? Our own righteous character? Our little pearl formed through responding to irritations of this life? Is that how we enter heaven? Is it? A lot of people believe that. And they're working so hard to earn it. But what does the Bible say? Turn to John 10, and we want to see whose pearly character is represented by these pearly gates. John 10, Jesus is talking about sheep and shepherds and the sheepfold. He describes in John 10, 7, the entrance to the gospel fold. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, read with me, I am the door of the sheep. And look at verse 9, and let's read that together. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. And similarly, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, no matter my efforts, I only enter heaven through Jesus. Did he face any irritations or parasites such as develop pearls in his life? Did he? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, one summary is found maybe in Isaiah chapter 53. We won't read the whole chapter, but especially verses 4 and 5 talk about just a little of what Jesus endured for us. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Isn't that amazing to consider Jesus' holy life, to consider all that he faced and endured was for all of us? Imagine the load of sin in just one life and multiply that by the world's population to see the burden that Jesus carried to the cross. Does that sound like a gate-sized pearl? 
or at least a symbol in that. Now let's read the very last verse in the Bible about pearls, and that's Revelation 22:14. Revelation 22, 14. It's the last verse about the pearly gates, too. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Here we see again, we must do something. What must we do? Keep his commandments. But is that by our own effort? Oh, struggling along? No. Everything we do is through Jesus. Jesus is our doorway. He's our pearly gate into heaven. And it's through his power. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians, what is it? 4.13 says. So through his power, we keep his commandments. Through his power, we conquer sin. We develop a character of pearl, not add a decoration of pearl. Getting into heaven is all about Jesus. And so as I studied this, I thought, wow, what, what a beautiful way to symbolize the entrance into heaven. And may we each find Jesus and his kingdom to be our precious treasure, our pearl of great price. It's time now to divide for our Sabbath school lesson. We have a special guest teacher in the sanctuary this morning. Pastor Harris has agreed to be part of our rotation, and he'll teach the class. And then the youth have their class in the fellowship hall, and I'll take the children in the library. Thank you for your study and your singing. And happy Sabbath to each of you. I guess it would help if I turn the microphone on. Can everybody hear okay? We are excited to have each of you here. We're excited to have our boys and girls here and our young people. And as they are making their way off to class, we hope that they have a wonderful time. And since this is Sabbath school, we need to start off with a quiz, don't we? Please don't all jump up and run out because uh, the quiz is really very simple. We won't even need a microphone with it. I just need you to use your ten fingers. On a scale of one to ten, ten being such a great week, the only thing better would be to be in heaven. Uh, zero fingers would be it was such a tough week. It would be hard to be any worse. How would you describe these past seven days since we were together for Sabbath last week? Scale of one to ten. Okay, I'm seeing some ten fingers. Uh, I'm seeing some sevens, some eights. Okay, awesome. Now, as we get started, and I wish we could take time to hear some of the stories of why you're picking that. But I'm also wondering, did you come with at least one prayer request this morning? How many say yes? I have something. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we are about to dig into your word. You know that. But we really need you to be our teacher. Many of us have had remarkable blessings this week. We also come with prayer requests, perhaps burdens on our hearts that only you can lift. And we are asking this morning that you would do just that. May you draw close to us and give us deeper understanding of your word and of your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory verse is such a powerful verse that hopefully everyone has tucked it into their brain already. And so we've got 10 seconds. You can cheat without cheating. Check it out. It's Psalms 19 verse 1. And then let's try it as a big choir, shall we? Are we ready? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In fact, it'd be fun to just keep going. 
but I need some help from the Bible. So let's turn there, and do we have a volunteer that would take, starting with verse 2 and taking us all the way down to verse 6. Psalms chapter 19, working our way all the way down to verse 6. If you're willing to read, please uh, raise your hand. We've got a roving mic that would come, and uh, we would be delighted to have you help participate. Who would like to be our first reader? We're small enough in number that we'll be able to give everybody an opportunity. Miss Mary, thank you. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Amen. Can you take us down to verse 6? Verses 5 and 6. Which is as the bridegroom cometh out of his chamber, and free, uh, rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the end of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Mm, thank you very much. And I'm not going to put Miss Mary on the spot. But I have three questions about this passage of Scripture that we just read. Question number one, what is the psalmist David trying to say in these verses that we just read? Anybody can answer the question, even in the tech booth. It's okay. Whoever wants to answer. What's David trying to say? All right, Miss Mary. He's trying to say that whatever we say and do is seen all over and cannot be held secret. Okay, God sees everything, awesome. Anything we think, anywhere we go, God sees it all, okay. Anything else? Well, what do you hear David saying in these verses? Miss June. Uh, the sun, moon, and stars, uh, they testify of the power of God and his glory. Okay. And, and, any, and so anywhere around the earth, people can know something about the true God just by the things they see. Wow. Just by, I, it, it prompts me to wonder, if you had to write down the most beautiful spot on earth you've been. Where would it be? Okay, Brother Jerry. I'm tied between two. Okay. Okinawa. Okinawa. I got to go snorkeling there. Okay. And that's the clearest water I've ever seen except Philippines. And I got to go boating there and going over. And both places, you could see 50 to 100 feet straight down. Whoa. Crystal clear water, looking at beautiful fish. Okay, awesome. Brother Skip. Brush Creek in Jay, Oklahoma. Really? Okay. What, what made it such a majestic place? It's not majestic, it's just um, quiet, okay. out in the boonies, uh -huh. crystal clear creek coming out of a spring, cold. Okay. Used to ride my horse down there and just jump off and get a drink right out of the creek. Sure. Go swimming every day. Wow. Um, had a rope you could swing off of. Okay. That was heaven to me. Amen. Now, now, okay, we have a hand over here, Miss Mary. I took a trip to Mount Matterhorn, 
And to be up there on top of that Mount Matterhorn and looking out at all of God's creations all around, mm -hmm. I could see it seemed like forever, and mm. it was beautiful. Mm. All of God's creation is beautiful. Mm. Wow. Anyone else? Fascinating locations. I, I'm hearing a common theme, either up high in mountains or something pertaining to water. Any, anyone else? What, what's the most beautiful spot you've been in God's creation? Somebody sent me a picture. Or I saw it. I can't say they didn't send it to me directly, but they shared this picture. I don't know if you can see it on the phone, but it's an extra large expanse. Anyone want to guess where that was taken? Great guess. Great guess. Beautiful, majestic mountains. If I'm not, anyone else. Wyoming is some beautiful country. Unless I'm confused, this was taken right here in Arkansas. I, I think Newton County to be specific, but around the Buffalo River area. And uh, as, uh, as I look, whether we're describing a... Uh, uh, when, when I was a kid, we took a, a trip up into Canada, and uh, uh, I forget the name, is it, uh, anyway, on the island of Victoria, they had a massive garden of special flowers and plants that had been developed. Uh, whether, whether that is what catches your eye, or the majesty of mountains in Colorado and Wyoming, or the hills of Arkansas, or what, whatever it is, God has some majestic creation. Even though this world has been marred with sin, there is still some amazing beauty that has come from his hand. Here's my question. If you go out on a, a clear night and you stop, Brother Skip alluded to it, just peaceful, no sound. Um, if you don't hear anything, how... Does this creation speak to us about a creator God? If the trees and the flowers, they're, you don't hear anything, but what, what speaks to us through them of our creator's majesty? Yes, Miss Mary. It's like last night when I went out on my back porch and looked out, Everything was quiet, as you said, but I could look up and see all the magic of the stars that God has put out there for us. Mm. It's just so beautiful, even at night. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of his greatness, Brother Jerry. Just the diversity of the animals. Mm -hmm. This morning, we, of course, in the winter, we feed birds. Mm -hmm. And all summer, you don't see them. You mm -hmm. hear them occasionally. Mm -hmm. But then now, we get two or three different small flocks mm. of different types to come around. Mm -hmm. And just the plants, there's just the diversity of it, you know. Mm -hmm. There's no other way it could be explained. It's just so neat. The, the variety and diversity that God would, uh, would create. Yes, Brother Skip. We got the mics hanging. <laughs> sure, go right ahead. Um, the the amazing thing about God's creations is we don't have a clue uh, the mag magnanimity of it, the 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 magnificence of it. Okay. Um, when you see a tree, people don't realize there is a mirror tree going down into the ground. The root system grows in the same uh, pattern and shape as the limbs and things that grow on the tree. Uh -huh. So you don't see any of that. Um, Mary talking about the stars, I've seen some um, Nassau uh, videos telling mm -hmm. how 
Mm -hmm. They have recorded the sounds that planets make. Planets actually have a sound. And when you read the Bible, does it talk about the music of the spheres, or is that a hymn we have? Okay. Um, they actually do have musical sounds coming from them. They've recorded them when going by with, like, the, uh -huh. the satellites. Okay. Um, I saw a video the other day of a young lady in Sweden who lives by a lake that freezes over half of the year. Uh -huh. And she takes microphones out to that lake and that frozen surface of the lake uh -huh. makes noises that you'd not believe. It sounds a lot like the, the whales when they recorded the whales under the ocean. Uh -huh. That ice is groaning and making musical sounds all the time. Wow. Um, so there's so many things in God's nature that we don't have a clue about. Wow. And when people wonder what they're going to do in heaven, <laughs> uh, think about exploring all these things to their fullest. To the fullest. So much that in my limited, finite human understanding, I don't grasp, Brother Mark. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but this morning early, while it was still cold, we went for a walk on the property, uh -huh. and we got to one part of the property that I had mowed a few days ago. Uh -huh. We just discovered it. Sometimes I just take off from the lawnmower and I'll start mowing. Uh -huh. But this morning we walked by it, and it looked like there were snowballs all over the ground. It was just in this area. Well, it, looked like, it looked like it was cotton or something. Yeah, it looked yeah, like you know, cotton yeah. uh -huh. until you got down in there, but it was little ice balls on the, on the grass. So I don't know if where I cut the grass, there was, uh -huh. I don't know. But it was weird. There was, it looked like snow, little inside yeah. snowballs, all over, cotton balls all over the ground. Wow. It was really neat. Amen. Amen. Evidences of God over here, Miss Jenny. And by the way, as uh, the envelope is coming around, we have our mission offering and our Sabbath school expense offering. Thank you for giving generously for both of those, Miss Janine. I just like to say, God, as everyone has been saying, God's creation is clearly seen. In fact, uh, Romans 1.20 says, mm -hmm. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his, in his internal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Wow. Uh, and... Uh, it also in Romans 1 22 it says those who do not recognize God as creator uh -huh. he calls fools Whoa! thank you for bringing this discussion right down to this and I wished we didn't need to have this discussion but I will never forget one Sabbath morning I I was in graduate school and uh, uh, was visiting a, uh, a church, Seventh-day Adventist church, and the head elder was scheduled to speak. And uh, he got up and opened the scriptures and began reading some of these verses and said, I need to tell you a personal story, why this message means so much to me. He said, I was playing racquetball with a friend who's a fellow Seventh-day Adventist, who's a highly educated person. And as we were talking, he began to explain why he no longer believed in the scriptural account of a creator God. And he said, I was so flabbergasted and so caught off guard that I, I, I didn't know what to say. But when I went home and began having my devotions, I said, uh, he said, I wanted to have clear scriptural evidence for why we can believe in the creator God and why that is our only safety because without him, what purpose do we have? And so it was uh, heartwarming to hear him preach a powerful message about the creation account of Scripture and why it is so pivotal as a foundation for all of Scripture. Thank you for touching on this in Romans. In fact, let's back up and let's, uh, let's add in verse 18 as well. 
And uh, let's go back to Romans chapter 1. And, and notice uh, starting in, uh, in verse 18 and 19. Somebody, uh, do you still have the mic? You willing to, to keep reading? Okay. Thank you, Sister Janine. <clears throat> Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Mm. Mm. So, so building on what you were saying in these verses here in Romans, what is Paul trying to tell us about God and his creative power? We have no excuse, okay? How's that? It's there. All, okay. we have, all we have to do is go out in nature and, and look at it and know that there is a God. Okay. But some people, they, uh, seems like they trust in their own scientific judgments. Right. Okay. And okay. uh, God calls them fools. Okay. Because. Sure, sure. And, and if I'm if I'm understanding the overarching theme of this week's lesson, we're asking about how do we make sure that God and His power is interwoven in academic arts and sciences. Uh, I'm assuming, and somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, when somebody goes to college, they earn a Bachelor of Arts degree or they earn a Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, how do you study accounting or how do you s study literature or art or music or molecular biology? How do you weave God into that academic course of study. Yes, Brother Skip. It's very simple. Um, even science has the answer that they want to ignore. Okay. Um, the very scientific definition of intelligence, uh -huh. uh, intelligent creation is uh, a, something being coded, having a code. Codes cannot happen in a vacuum. Codes cannot happen out of nothingness or chaos. Codes mm. show an intelligence behind it. Mm. All living creatures have DNA codes uh -huh. within their, their bodies, uh -huh. within their structures, uh -huh. that can't just happen out of chance. Okay. That's just science. That's, that's just science. Wow. Okay, anyone else? We're looking at passages of Scripture. Do, do, does it simply mean involving God in, in art class or in science class? Is it simply starting the class with a Bible verse each day? Or is it more? Great idea to start class with a scripture, okay. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Brother Elijah. Something interesting I just thought of. You're asking about how God would be involved in literature and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Um, there's a law called Ziff's Law, which basically means every... Um, the words that you use the most have a percentage and each one below is half as much and so it makes a curve hmm. and that law is in every single language every single book ever in mm -hmm. every pop population mm -hmm. it's in solar flares that distribution is in everything 
and it's it's by design and it's just an interesting thing that shows up in places like that wow wow so. different evidence that's fascinating thank you thank you w would you travel with me to a couple of verses in scripture let's go to nehemiah chapter 9 nehemiah the old testament book of nehemiah notice uh, chapter 9 and verse 6 nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6 somebody we need a reader nehemiah 9 verse 6 is that a hand going up to uh, volunteer? All right. Nehemiah 9, 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the hosts of heaven worshipeth thee. Mm. Amen. What's he saying there? What is God saying to us through that verse? Or let me rephrase the question, uh, uh, Miss Sarah, what is that verse saying to you as you read it? And forgive me for putting people on the spot. I love hearing the insights that God gives each of you. And uh, uh, It just means that nothing would continue to exist without him either. Sometimes we think of him um, as creating it in the beginning, but he also is the one who sustains it every day. Oh, thank you. So, so yes, God created everything, but he didn't just say poof and make it and then leave it out to fend for itself. He sustains us moment by moment, day by day. There's a fascinating quote coming out of our lesson in uh, Steps to Christ, page uh, 70, I'm sorry, 85. God would have his children appreciate his works and delight in the simple, quiet beauty with which he has adorned our earthly home. He is a lover of the beautiful, and above all that is outwardly attractive, he loves beauty of character. He would have us cultivate purity and simplicity, the quiet graces of the... Anybody want to guess? The flowers. Hmm. So, so another scripture, Psalms 96. Psalms 96. We're, we're talking about the majesty and beauty of God's creation. But in, in Psalms 96 and verse 9, we add a different dimension. Psalms 96, verse 9. Who's willing to read for us? We want to give... Oh, all right. Thank you. I'm torn between wanting to involve everybody but not wanting to put someone on the spot. So uh, please let me know if you don't want to be... Uh, but thank you, Brother Jim. Psalms 96, 9. Please. Or worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. Mm, mm. One more picture, and uh, we'll come uh, with a question on, uh, on this particular passage. Let me see if I can pull this picture up really quick. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, it was shared uh, this week, and it caught my attention because it was talking about beauty. This is a church. Can you see the church? <laughs> There's no walls on two sides. There, there's some old rusty pews. It, 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 would you describe that as a beautiful church? Why? Oh, okay, I hear outdoors. Yes. 
It's the people who come in. It's the people who come into the church? Okay. Yes, Miss Mary. I feel that all churches are beautiful for God is there. Ah, the beauty of the church is not defined by the chandeliers or the marble or, or the stained glass, but it's defined by the presence of God. Wow. Okay. So is there beauty that is separate or that is not spiritually uplifting? And maybe that's a, a, a part of, of art or of beauty that I would just as soon us skip over and not talk about. But are there some things that can be attractive, but they do not bring glory to God? I'm hearing yes. Help, help uh, embellish. Okay. Uh, I'll come to uh, Ms. Heather and then over to Ms. Janine beautiful to me but it is to a lot of people oh, sorry <laughs> okay and um, if you go to like an art museum or you see some artists and they just like randomly have paint splattered on canvas and sometimes they'll go for thousands or maybe even a million dollars and people think it's beautiful I haven't gotten there yet because I don't think it is but okay people think and there's nothing spiritual about it okay it's just people see it as beautiful okay okay Okay, awesome example of, of, of something that may be perceived as beautiful, but it's not drawing to the glory of God. Who else had their hand? Miss uh, Janine, I think. I was just going to say in the Garden of Eden, everything was beautiful, even that fruit that Satan was oh. in that, remember the tree he was in, and, that, and there was Eve looking at, and it looked pleasant. Okay. It really good. Okay. But. <laughs> but. <laughs> she. It was the tree of knowledge, good and evil. God had said, "Don't eat it." Right. In, in fact, let's. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Let's read that passage together, shall we? Let's jump over to Genesis chapter three. Here's the Garden of Eden. Here's no sin. It's beautiful. It's fresh from the hand of the Creator. And here in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, we find Eve standing at the forbidden tree looking at this ugly fruit that is repulsive to her. Is that right? Uh, somebody read uh, Genesis 3 verse 6 and correct me, okay? Go ahead, Brother Jerry. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be des desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Mm. Pleasant to the eyes, beautiful to look at, but clearly something God had said to stay away from. Okay. Hmm. Our, our lessons this quarter are coming from the book Education. And in light of this weekend focusing on Revelation... This is an interesting first paragraph in the chapter, Science in the Bible. It wasn't directly referenced uh, that I saw in this week's lesson, but it speaks very pointedly. Since the book of nature and the book of revelation bear the impress of the same master mind, they cannot but speak in harmony. By different methods and in different languages, they witness to the same great truths. Science is ever discovering new wonders, but science brings from her research nothing that rightly understood conflicts with divine revelation. The book of nature and the written word shed light upon each other. They make us acquainted with God by teaching us something of the laws through which he 
works. So let's go on a treasure hunt. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Let's go to chapter 1. And what, what I would like for us to try to do together as a team is, is look through chapter 1. And in fact, let's just read uh, the verses together. We won't put anyone on the spot for doing the, the whole chapter. But I, I'm looking for three questions. What is Solomon saying in that passage? How does it apply to us today and where else in scripture can we see these lessons being taught so let's go to proverbs chapter 1 and let's listen in why don't who has not read that would like to has everyone had an opportunity to read okay uh miss heather would you mind doing the first four verses would that be okay and, uh, and then someone else uh, on this side, raise your hand, and we'll come to you next, and we'll work our way through the chapter. Thank you so much. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instructions of wisdom, justice, judgment, equity, equity. Um, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Mm. We're talking about wisdom. Who wants to read next? Continuing in verse 5. Who's up next? Okay. Thank you, Brother Mark. How far? Uh, how about 5 through 8? Okay. <clears throat> a wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother. Mm. We find a reference that uh, Miss Janine just gave us back with, uh, with Paul in Romans. When we neglect God's wisdom, we're, uh, uh, we're rather foolish. We are, we are fools. Who wants to take verse 9 uh, through 12? 9 through 12. Okay, Brother Jim, thank you so much. Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. Yes, please. First Proverbs 9. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as they that go down into the pit. Hmm. We, sh we shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Hmm. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to do evil and make haste to shed blood. Um, someone grab verse 17 to 20. Okay, Sister Janine, thank you. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Is that a mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. chapter? Yes, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, did you want me to go on? Uh, to verse 20, if you don't mind. And they lay wait for their own blood, and they lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the Owners thereof, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. Hmm, wisdom. Uh, who's willing to take 21 to 24? 
Okay, Ms. I'd Mary? Like to read it. Oh, okay. Let me push pause, Ms. Mary, and uh, go ahead, Ms. Janine. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. So I thought I was... Uh, studying this week and I thought and I wrote down if we have heavenly wisdom we will use the knowledge we have in the right way heavenly wisdom is knowing how to use the knowledge we have in the right way mm, amen thank you thank you I had to take a class one time and it was supposed to be about research methods and uh, they, they came out, they, they emphasized that the best way to prove something beyond a shadow of a doubt is to have what they called a double blind randomized controlled trial. So the person doing the research didn't know, the people participating didn't know, but they would be randomly assigned to two different groups and neither of them at either end knew what group they were in and that way the experiment could unfold. But that's got a problem because there are certain things you can't study that way. And the example they gave was you can't do a randomized controlled trial on, on whether it's safe to jump out of an airplane without a parachute. You understand why. <laughs> There's a certain group that it wouldn't be ethically to randomize them to, and yet is there anybody here that doubts jumping out of an airplane without a parachute is a bad idea? We, brothers and sisters, we can't subject God to a randomized controlled trial. We don't need to. Amen? He is the author of everything beautiful. He's the author of science. But wisdom seeks his word, his message, his principles. Let's listen to Miss Mary as she keeps taking us through this chapter about divine wisdom. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gate. In the city she, sit, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight their scorning. The fools hate knowledge. Turn you at your, my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Okay. Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hands, and no man regardeth. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would not none of my reproof. Mm. Does what we're hearing in these verses reflect a tragedy that happens in many secular studies of art and science. Writing God out of the equation, ignoring his wisdom. Notice verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of of the Lord. Would someone take the, these last four verses, 29 through 33? Somebody willing to finish up the chapter for us? Who would grab it? Uh, Miss June? Okay, coming to Miss June. Uh, 
verse 30. Mm -hmm. They would none my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Mm. So we just read a very lengthy but powerful chapter. What take home message do you get from these verses? And how does it fit with today's lesson? Miss Mary. What I get out of it is that God's telling us not to listen to the world mm -hmm. and to be drawn away from him. Because if we are and we listen to the world, we will lose our place in heaven. Okay. And so he's warning us and telling us to not be foolish and to listen to him and not the world. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Someone else? Brother Skip. Uh, it says they despise knowledge. Uh -huh. And you can see that in the world of science. Whenever they come up to something that can prove um, the creation of God, uh -huh. they try to hide it. Okay. There's, uh, there's been books written about how in the world of archaeology in particular, uh, they make all kinds of finds that prove the Bible true but they've been buried in the bottom of uh, museums <laughs> instead of put out on display because they don't want the world to see it. Okay. And you have to think, they are willfully despising knowledge. They, uh -huh. they know that uh -huh. they found something that's true uh -huh. and they want to hide it. Uh huh. Wow, thank you very much. Awesome insight, Some, someone else, Ms. June. I, I said Miss June. I am so sorry, Miss Janine. <laughs> so what I get out get out of it, I think uh, it, what it teaches us is uh, true. Uh, the question was, what does this teach us concerning what true Christian education should be about? Uh huh. We need to have wisdom to live a godly life in an ungodly world. Wow. Okay. So, so we, we hear and, and we see firsthand the great controversy battle between God's perfect plan and the devil's constant attempt to erase God from the beauty of his creation, to redefine what truly is beautiful, to, to write him out of the discoveries of science, and, and to try to philosophize without looking to the fountain of wisdom. Someone else? Brother Jerry. You know, bringing this into, I like to bring things into reality. Creation and evolution. Mm. Uh, they found a new discovery recently that man was with the last part of the dinosaurs and the early mammals. Mm. So it's not as old as they thought, but they say it's still older than we thought that where the Ice Age was. And we have to keep in our minds what the age of the earth really is according to the Bible. Mm. And we can see the aspects of it. Mm -hmm. If we just listen to him, he'll show us. Mm. But they deny that. Mm -hmm. But they deny that. Uh, coming back to the book Education, there's this uh, on page 130. It says, when consideration is given to man's opportunities for research, for how brief his life, how limited his fear of action, how restricted his vision, how frequent and how great the errors in his conclusions, especially as concerns the events thought to antedate 
Bible history, how often the supposed deductions of science are revised or cast aside with what readiness the assumed period of the earth's development is from time to time increased or diminished by millions of years, and how the theories advanced by different scientists conflict with one another. Considering all this, shall we, for the privilege of tracing our descent from germs and mollusks and apes, consent to cast away that statement of holy writ so grand in its simplicity, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Genesis 1, 27. Shall we reject that genealogical record prouder than any treasured in the courts of kings, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God? Luke three thirty eight. Oh, my friends, rightly understood both the revelations of science and the experiences of life are in harmony with the testimony of Scripture to the constant working of God in nature. What a God. What a God. And, and, and as we look at, at, at these uh, let me just pause for a second because that clock keeps ticking and I'm afraid they're going to ring a bell when we least expect it. But as you've been studying this week, what spoke to your heart? Any nuggets that uh, we've not got all the way through this week's lesson and, and we've not so much gone day by day as looking at the bigger picture, what did you come here this morning hoping that we would dig into or that spoke to your heart from this week's lesson? Somebody. There's two major issues that challenge the accuracy of science. And uh, if you look on Friday's lesson of this week, the first one requires natural causes for natural events. But brothers and sisters, we have a supernatural God who can speak the word and there could be light and grass and trees and flowers and all of these things. And the second is the consistency of nature. We want to assume that everything stays the same and we forget the flood and we forget that things wouldn't even exist without the sustaining power of God. What did you get from this week's lesson, Brother Skip? Just continuing on with your thought. Um, man in science emulates creation in a very pitiful and falling short manner. But God creates. Yes. They can't. That's right. They lose. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So my prayer today as we have looked at some of these verses, we've run out of time to get into Timothy and to Job and, and some of the other powerful nuggets. My prayer today is that we will once again say thank you to God for being our creator. And secondly, that we too our educators. We may not have a classroom with a biology lab, but each of us from day to day have an opportunity to share and to live our belief in God being the foundation of all education, whether it's art, whether it's science, it's based. And as we 
honor him as our creator, he will use us to share that with others. Are you willing to let him use you as an educator? Whether it's praising him for uh, that wonderful creek out in the middle of nowhere that you can get a drink out of the, uh, out of the creek, or whether it's the stars at night or the complexity of cells and the working of the human body, what an amazing God. Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, there's so much that our human minds cannot wrap around. But we are so thankful for the messages of your word. And that rightly understood, science confirms and nature echoes. And Lord, we long to be with you and have you teach us. Because you are the source of all true education. And Father, we want you to be a part of everything we study. And we ask you to each day keep bringing your truths alive from your word. Thank you for this Sabbath and what you're going to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We will take a short break and be back in to praise God through songs and worship. Special thank you to our Mike and tech team and each of you for helping to participate this morning.